Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's show, Laura and I discuss how to get work done when your whole working life is going from one meeting to the next. We talk to Ron Deverman again about indigenous knowledge, music, and the family farm. And finally, a chicken can lay around 225 eggs per year. In the U.S. produces approximately 65 billion eggs per year. That's like 25 million chickens putting in good work. China is the world's largest producer of eggs with over 160 billion eggs per year. That's like a gazillion chickens. So there you go. Who wants breakfast? <laughs> I do. I always want yeah. breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of champions, of course. Only good things for breakfast. I definitely didn't have pizza for breakfast today. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> no comment. Hit that music. <laughs> Right, we have two events for you this week. First up is the NCAEP, which is North Carolina Chapter Wetland Assessment Method and Training Course on Tuesday, December 6th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And secondly, we have the NAP Advanced NEPA Workshop running again for those of you in Hawaii time on Wednesday, December 7th from 8 to 4.30 HST, which I didn't really know that was what that was called. <laughs> yeah, Hawaii time. <laughs> right. Check them out at naap.org. And today's episode is sponsored by STV. STV is an award-winning professional firm consistently ranking among the country's top companies in education, justice, highways, bridges, rail, and mass transit sectors. They attribute their success as a direct result of their employees' commitment to innovation and quality. Throughout the United States and Canada, STV's professional, technical, and support personnel offer services to a broad and expanding client base. Check them out at stvinc.com. If you would like to sponsor a future episode, head on over to www.environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out the sponsor form for details. So the question was from Sam was, how do we actually get work done when we have so many meetings and stuff going on throughout the week, unless we're just gods and goddesses of multitasking, which I love that title. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I'll totally take it. I am a master at multitasking. That's for sure. I'm not one of those people that, that believes that multitasking is, I believe there's a time and place for multitasking. Yes. If I have work that doesn't require much use of my brain, I can watch television and do some work at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Reply course. to emails, comment on social media, stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, prioritization is probably one of my most important skills, I think, aside from being organized. How about you, Nick? Yeah. So like, yeah, I think, Prioritization is very, very important. I think when you have your schedule, you know your meetings, you have an understanding and you need to give your attention to certain things, right? There are certain stuff that no matter what you have to do, if you are running the meeting, you can't have the TV on. If you're coordinating the thing, you can't reply to an email while you're running the meeting. It does, just Doing doesn't work that else. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to be focused on that meeting. If that's all of your meetings for the day, you're running everything then you're going to be working off hours. That's just the truth. That is, you know, what you have to do to get things done. There are other times, and, uh, you know, this is not an industry secret, but where you have a meeting on and you're able to get other work done during that meeting because you know that your part's small and you're paying attention, you know, listening for these certain things. So that does mean you have to be able to multitask a little because you have to pay attention to what is relevant to you. But at least for me, I'm able to kind of, you know, you know, do that balance. And it's not, it's not perfect. You know, you make mistakes, but that happens all the time. And, you know, it's not, I would say necessarily a bad thing because you you need to get stuff done. People are relying on you to get information to them. You have to be able to, to do that in a timely manner. Yeah. The other thing is delegating. If yeah. it is not something that I have to do, I will gladly give it to someone else. Yeah. And that's a real, real challenge, especially when you start your career, it's really hard to delegate, right? You know, you know, you're basically being delegated to, but as you grow, you'll start to see like, there's a, there's a big shift. And there's some folks in our group that are doing that shift now where you, you go from like, I have to do everything to, I have to get everything done. And those are definitely two different statements. And you know, how you get it done isn't really what matters. There's, there's countless examples. There's anecdotes and allegories about that exact thing, right? You know, it's like, it doesn't matter if it takes you three weeks, so long as you get it done, if that's the timeline that we have, right? It's supposed to be done in three weeks. It doesn't matter how, just that it's done in three weeks. So there's lots of 
ways to get things to get SaaS done. There's lots of ways to delegate too. It doesn't even have to be in your organization. It can be getting an outside vendor to print documents for you, whereas so that you don't have to do it because you have other things. There's lots of different creative ways that you can do that. Yeah. And as Sam knows from working behind the scenes on the show, we use software and tools and project management systems. And these things also help you work a lot smarter. So you spend less time. So maybe you can't delegate something to someone else to do, but you can definitely make a system a lot more efficient or effective. And if it's something that you're doing repeatedly or scheduling meetings, like scheduling meetings might be as simple as getting a calendar link and letting your software handle the software for you. So you're not delegating to a person, but you can kind of delegate to a software. Yeah. And like I say that there's, and sometimes we tend to do this thing where we're like, oh, well, there's only one way to do this task. There's only one way to get it done. They said, I have to do it. So I have to do it. And, you know, sometimes that's not true. Sometimes it's, it just needs to be done. You've been given the responsibility to make sure it does. And those are definitely not the same. So it's just kind of a mentality shift. I think sometimes you have to think of it that way. If you don't have time to do something and it needs to get done, even as a junior staff, there are usually other junior staff that you can pull in and be like, Hey, I need help on this. Right. And if you have good coworkers, they'll they'll help you out. You know, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And if the question is, how do you get your work work done? Sometimes you might have to decline a meeting. You know, maybe you don't, maybe not every meeting you have to be at, you know, you can ask someone to, can I skip this one out or send me the notes or let me know if there's anything that I need to do after this meeting, if it's not one that you have to be at. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, you also have to balance that with your regular life too, right? You have to go to doctor's appointments. You have to, you know, do whatever in your personal life that you want to do too. You don't, you don't want to spend all your time working. That's no fun. Right, Laura? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> you do work pretty hard though. I will, I will admit that. I think I fool everyone to thinking that I work pretty hard. I think I've gotten to a point where I enjoy the work that I do. So it doesn't feel hard. There's definitely sometimes there's things that I don't want to be doing, but I'm like, oh, got to get it done. Those things I will try to get done as fast as possible. Or again, how do I make this easier or get someone else to do it? And sometimes those things take, you know, the first time you delegate to somebody or like hire someone to help you or learn a software, it takes time. Yeah. But then once you've got that in place, like anytime I bring people in to learn how to use Trello, like it takes time to get them used to that and to say, okay, it's in Trello, keep going to Trello. But once everybody's got it, it's, it's so helpful. So I think a lot of the barrier too, while some people get stuck in this, like, I have never ending piles of to do's yeah. is because they don't really put in that little extra effort up front to, to make an efficiency in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, honestly, organization goes a long way here. Just planning out your day. You know, we've talked a little bit about that, but like just starting the day going, okay, what do I need to get done? What are, what are my goals for the day? Make one of them easy so you can do it. It's <laughs> just, because right. there's, there's definitely days where it's like, I have this huge list and I didn't get to anything. And that's, that's hard. I had a day this week where I was on the phone, literally talking from 1230 to six. Like that's not fun. That's hard to do. It's hard to get anything done when you're literally having conversations that long. So like, you know, it's like eat a Snickers at the end of the day or something. I mean, whatever it is, just have a tangible goal. You can, you can finish no matter what. It's helpful because it will, it will burn you out if you, if you can't, if you're always chasing that, that list. So, but that, yeah, organization goes a long, long way. I mean, I think about it in my career, like I remember having like five of these Neva documents due almost at the same exact time. And I just spent half a day, like planning out how I can write them, how I can get them reviewed, how I can do all this. And it was one of the the easiest things to do, even though it was super busy. My plan really genuinely helped me get it done. So yeah, that's really, really important. Yeah. And your company culture can play a part in that too, because if the culture of the company is like everyone's at all meetings every time and they don't care about when you find time to get the work done, that could be very difficult. But some companies will even say like, you know, we have no meetings Thursday. That's a policy. And that lets people set time aside for themselves to work on that work that needs to get done, which is nice. So if that's not something that your department or company has and you see a need for it, maybe that's a suggestion that can be made. You know, can we have a free day or two free days a week where we don't have meetings? And then so it's almost better to have one full long day of meetings. And then the following day is a day you can do work because almost every meeting comes with work afterwards. (laughs) Yeah. 
or gosh, I had a, a couple of weeks ago. I literally, I was having a meeting, getting off the meeting and had two tasks to do. And I'm like, yeah. what is happening today? I'm like, <laughs> None of this was on my radar. And I'm like, okay, all right, I guess. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> working. Uh, so awesome. Fun. All right. Well, let's wrap this up and get to our interview. Sounds good. Welcome back to EPR. Today, we have Ron Deverman back on the show. Ron is Vice President and National Environmental Planning Lead at STV, as well as an esteemed NAEP fellow. He is currently spearheading the Leadership Committee, and we are really glad to have you back, Ron. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, real excited to be back and uh, with you both. So going to enjoy our conversation, I'm sure. Absolutely. Well, it's a great time of year to have you back, too, around the holidays. You have been an awesome champion for EPR. I know you're listening to every episode, even if it's not every week, and always giving us your feedback, which is just really nice to hear that there are people listening and you're you're liking it. So I have an unfair question to start us off with, but do you have a, a favorite episode or a favorite topic so far? I actually, this week, uh, listened to Sunny's uh, episode here recently, and she's just so dynamic. And, I know. You know, yeah, I, I love her. And she was a great uh, keynote speaker at the NAP conference this year. So it's almost like every time I listen to the episodes, then that's that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> until, until next Friday. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh -huh. Awesome. Great answer. Uh, Sunny is a lot of fun, though. And what's new with you? How are things at STV? They're going really well. I do have a national position with them, and that's that's quite exciting. And it's great to be uh, working with environmental professionals all across the country to help grow, you know, grow environmental services uh, at the company. And so... I love it. And uh, we've been doing a lot of community involvement, too, on our projects. And the topics of uh, equity certainly come up very much in our clients' mind. And I've actually been meeting one-on-one -on -one with some of our clients on how to better sort of integrate the equity and inclusion in outreach and then just within the decision-making process. So. That's great. What kind of questions are they asking you? Well, they want to make sure they're reaching all populations, you know, especially when we're doing if it's a, a NEPA project and it's going into environmental justice residential areas, uh, you know, lower income and minority mm -hmm. areas. They want to make sure they're doing the proper outreach so really all voices can be heard and actually get them involved in whether it's working groups or a, a steering committee, uh, that sort of thing, just to be part of the decision making throughout that whole process and making sure the whatever decision is made, it's an equitable one as far as the benefits going to what sometimes is, you know, very un underserved populations and, and residents. So it's a very important topic. And literally, I think all of the transportation agencies that I'm working with now have equity officers uh, as part of their leadership or mm -hmm. and or uh, diversity, equity and inclusion officers. So that's just terrific to see. In fact, I presented this year at an international conference on transport and health on transit equity. And I'm now uh, putting together a manuscript related to that. And I'm actually now interviewing several of our clients in Florida, Houston, out in LA, and even here in Chicago about interviewing their DEI officers about equity and how they're incorporating that into their, you know, main policy now for their agencies. Yeah. So that's really interesting. And I kind of want to take us down a little bit of a path here too. So we know some legislation has come out. We know that we have the phase two revisions to the 2020 NEPA regulations coming out as well. And that language, you know, we're expecting you know, emphasis on the importance of indigenous knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So I know this is an important topic for you. And if Laura would stop taking the questions away from me, I could keep asking. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us um, about the importance of, you know, indigenous knowledge and maybe share a story or two about it from your career? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. And 
Just the one thing I would say about the phase two revisions, I see there's really four pillars coming out from that. They're addressing climate change within the new NEPA regulations. They're addressing more engaged public involvement. Also, environmental justice and equity, what we were just talking about. And then the fourth pillar really is the importance of indigenous knowledge in federal decision making. I'm just so happy to see that. And I was very aware that uh, CEQ Chair Brenda, Brenda Mallory actually conducted at least a half a dozen meetings around the country with key tribal leaders, and that helped CEQ put that language together. But my interest actually in indigenous knowledge actually goes back, believe it or not, 30 plus years to 1990. And I was actually in the Pacific Northwest. I was the manager of planning and environmental services for Pacific Northwest planning and engineering architecture firm, and I managed uh, three environmental assessments where I worked directly with uh, the Native American tribes one-on-one. And I'll give you three examples. The first one was with uh, the Muckleshoot tribe, and this was related to a residential and master plan development just about maybe 20 miles south of Seattle. And I worked directly with the senior planner of the Muckleshoot tribe. In fact, he was actually on our project team. Washington State is one of the states that has their own state NEPA, you know, State Environmental Policy Act. Mm -hmm. So that's why we were doing the environmental assessment. The second example is working directly with the Colville Tribal Nation, and that's in eastern Washington on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. There was, uh, again, another residential development, but very, very low density, more like uh, large ranch type residential. And it was near some of the Colville tribe's land. So we brought them in and hiked the whole area. And they showed us places that uh, they felt should not be developed and then made sure, you know, we understood exactly where their land was versus the land that the entity that was developing this res- low density residential area was located. And the third, this is the coolest uh, example I can give you. The third was actually I was doing an environmental assessment on uh, Mount Bailey. And Mount Bailey is in kind of south central Oregon. The proponent, this was an EA, and the proponent was wanting to do snowcat skiing on Mount Bailey. In other words, no infrastructure, no ski lifts, nothing. It's just the snowcat takes you up and then you just ski down. It's very, very environmentally sensitive. In fact, believe it or not, you can actually Google Mount Bailey snowcat skiing and it will come up and it's a very successful ski area for people. But I knew the Clackamas tribe in Central Oregon had a very close interests in Mount Bailey. So we reached out to them and I spent a lot of time sitting at the table, just listening, you know, not talking, you know, not being a talking head, just listening mm-hmm. and to their concerns. And then we decided actually to hike up the mountain together. So I hiked up with the tribal leaders all the way to the top. And then they showed me a couple areas on the top of the mountain where it was sacred to them, but they didn't want any anything disturbed whatsoever. And I just thought that was a really, really cool experience that's very alive and in my memory today. So I've had I've had that sensibility, you know, for the last three decades now to see it actually come true, you know, within <laughs> uh, our federal regulations is terrific. Yeah. And, you know, you touched on something that I really I, I want to follow up on the importance of listening right mm-hmm. you had the wherewithal to say okay I'm not going to tell people what's going to happen I want to hear what they have to say and then they open up to you how do you kind of develop that need because a lot of times when we're doing projects we want to be like well this is what's going to happen this is how it's going to happen but taking a second 
to listen to the concerns of the community is super important. It makes your relationship so much stronger. How do you develop that, that sense of, you know, how important and valuable that listening skill is? Yeah. Well, first of all, as a human being, it has to come within you and you have to develop that softer side of you, that empathetic, you know, empathic side of you to be understanding of everyone, despite, you know, who they are or, you know, if you have differences or whatever, I think, you know, each each person is unique. And that's what I look for. I look for the uniqueness in everyone. And to do that, you really have to to be mindful. And as I said, uh, it's like empathic listening and just to reach a deeper level of understanding, okay, on what their thoughts and values are. And so from that, then you can bring this deeper understanding back, you know, to the process that we use. And I think also over time, we've just gotten a lot better to do community outreach in a very personal way. And I actually managed a project in um, the city of Detroit and again, lower income and minority neighborhoods. And we didn't call our gatherings public meetings. We called them community conversations. Yeah. Yeah. We just got together around tables and I, I just listened. So that's where it comes from. It's just, you know, once you gain that deeper understanding, then you bring a different demeanor to the community involvement process. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, even your industry, I think it's important you know, for the community, but, you know, each industry has its own quirks and uniqueness, right? So yeah. um, how each client approaches outreach has to be a little bit different. So what are, what are the differences maybe then in the transportation industry, right? We have, you know, rail and, you know, roadways, and many other you know, nuances in there. So how do you see, do you see that they're typically following the same trends? Are there big differences between groups, depending on you know what client you're talking to or what industry that you're in? Yeah, that's a great question because I actually started my career in the central office of uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation, the Bureau of Design and Environment. So the focus of my early career was highways and bridges, but really for the last 20, you know, 20, 25 years, it's been rail focused. And what I've found is on the highway side, the DOTs, they're moving in the direction I was just talking about, but it comes from a more traditional base. Whereas even projects I was managing in the mid 90s and 2000s, like in Denver and Salt Lake City, there was much more community involvement, engagement with the residents one on one. I did the in Den the city of Denver, I managed the EIS for the West LRT line, and that, that's the one that goes out to Golden. And we had a very interdisciplinary team. It was not only planners and engineers and architects and landscape architects, but we actually had musicians and artists on our team as well, because at each, we decided, and again, our transit client was very, very supportive of this. We decided that at each transit stop, we were going to do placemaking, you know, like develop plazas, put up artwork. There's actually a national program called Art in Transit, and we were able to get some money for that. And even one of the artists was uh, did uh, music and sound installations, and he'd already done several around the city of Detroit. And it's really cool. So I said, well, you, you got to be on our team and, you know, <laughs> so you can do one of your sound installations at one of the transit stop. And clearly now the transit agencies are in the forefront related to this type of more intimate outreach and dialogue with the actual residents who are going to be using their system. And then it also gets back to what we were talking about earlier about equity as well and the importance of mobility and access 
for for everyone, you know, including those with disabilities and so on. So that's awesome. I, I yeah. love that you keep bringing art and stuff into the science world, and even to this level of actual practical applications. You'd mentioned before that you and you've described quite a few different projects across the country that you have a national position, but how many projects do you work on at one time? Well, very good question. Right now, I helped win general planning, general engineering contract with uh, Houston Metro Transit. Uh, I did that a couple of years ago, and so I'm still involved with that. Here locally in Chicago, we have a program management contract with our Metro commuter rail system here, and uh, I'm overseeing the NEPA projects on their behalf. And then I'm actually uh, managing an EA through the Surface Transportation Board, and this is a freight rail EA for Canadian National, and that's actually here in Illinois and Missouri. They're acquiring some rail line from another Class 1 freight railroad. So those are the real active projects, but I'm also actively pursuing three other projects. So I'm meeting with those clients. And then I try to support, we have bi-monthly and sometimes monthly calls in different regions of the country, whether it's the Southeast, Northeast, or Pacific Northwest. I help support their efforts. That's great. That sounds like you stay very busy and we appreciate you listening to EPR when you have time. <laughs> I multitask sometimes. Right. But that leads me to my our next question. This is perfect. That's a lot of projects in a lot of distant places that are very important. So that there's a lot of calls and meetings and community outreach and things mixed in there. But Sam asked us recently how Nick and I get so much work done or how we get any work done when we have so many calls and so many meetings to attend. So just curious about what you might say about that. Oh, wow. Well, of course, it's setting the priorities and knowing what the big rocks are that you have to get done that day. So I, I identify that. I was really fortunate when I, we, uh, I lived in the, Mary and I actually lived in the Pacific Northwest and um, the firm I was with sent me to the Stephen Covey uh, Leadership Center. And so I got trained by Stephen Covey himself and nice. uh, in the seven habits. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it really helped me focus. And every week, and I still do this, every week I know there's the big rocks I have to do and when I have to do them, and I write them down, actually. And that's not only in work, but also, you know, personal life and uh, my creative life as well. And just making sure it's a very well-rounded experience I'm having each day and each week. So, Yeah, that's a great answer. And, uh, you know, those big rocks. I, my favorite too is when we have, you, have, you know, your big rocks and then you get, a, you get another one. <laughs> yeah. um, so how do you manage uh, those surprises that come during the day? You have your plan and now you have to alter it. I think that comes with experience. You know, I've got 35 years in now. There's no way what I'm doing now I could have done in the first five to 10 years of my career. Right. And so it's just being able to absorb it, understand it, you know, uh, understanding the project delivery deadline and how that, that new big rock that just came, came in you know, how that fits, how that fits with everything else I'm doing. So, yeah. And, you know, it speaks to, you know, like a lot of what we talked about today speaks to you um, being a really strong leader. And like I say, we're really happy to have you here as a result of that, but you also head up the NAP leadership committee. So what's going on with that? Yeah, that's been a, a great, great opportunity. I got a, a great leadership team. Uh, in fact, uh, Laura is uh, one of the members and we do the leadership blog for NAP. We interface with NAP and American Public University's uh, student chapter on a regular basis. We're now in the process of developing a potential mentor-mentee program for NAP and I'm basing it, I want to base it on what uh, the Academy of Board Certified Environmental Professionals has been doing. For the last year and a half, I've been uh, on the board of trustees of APSEP, and I've not only been chairing their awards committee, but I've also been on the 
mentor mentee uh, working group and i actually am mentoring someone who is a uh, certified environmental professional it you know in training he's yeah. in the process of getting his full cep uh, sean desantis and he a project manager down in South Florida Water Management District. And we interface every three or four weeks. And he's just doing fantastic. And I've I've learned so much from him. You know, it's just amazing. It's just been a, a great, rewarding relationship for both of us. So yeah, and I I love that. And I'm glad you brought up mentor programs. And I'm really glad you brought up that you're both learning. So what in your mind makes a good mentorship program? And how do you learn from your mentee? Well, I think a good program is, again, they, uh, APSEP has great handbooks. That's a good start. In fact, they've just been updated and that helps you. But it's what I found is just getting to know your mentee on not only a professional level, but a personal level as well. And understanding every aspect of you know what they're dealing with at work and and what their personal life may be like and then just giving you know of your wisdom i think that just just comes as you grow in your career and i've been real excited because sean's uh, has got in the last few six months here he's gotten a promotion already and he's about ready to submit his uh, cep application so i was very excited for him nice that's awesome yeah i want to and somebody else who i admire tremendously in fact i was just on a phone call with emily gulick because she's a CEP IT and we were having our CEP, CEP IT quarterly meetings just a couple of days ago. And I had the honor at the 2022 NAP conference to award her. She actually won APSEP's Emerging Environmental Professional Achievement Award in 2021, but we weren't able to actually, that was virtual meeting so i was able to i had the honor to actually award it to her at the 2022 conference in fort lauderdale because I'm, I'm very very inspired by her and i think she really shows what leadership is you know she is leading nap's environmental justice committee and doing a fantastic fantastic job and i've been certainly very very inspired by what she's said and i I got to read. Um, she sent me an email after that meeting, and uh, it was just really cool. And I printed it out, and I'm going to keep it in some kind of one of my. I have different notebooks where I'm writing down new ideas and innovative thoughts and stuff. And but she said, "Hi, Ron. I wanted to reach out directly and generally say thank you for being an excellent role model in our industry. You're so intelligent, kind, and consistent." And it doesn't go unnoticed. And happy birthday as well. So, and so I just really appreciated that acknowledgement just because I think she's just so dynamic. And every time I talk to her, I'm I'm learning from her. And she embodies what I feel is leadership. And I've written a couple articles where I've talked about leadership. One of those was called Shifting our horizon. And there's a statement in there I made, leadership has to do with how we create and shape our future and the future of those we lead. There was another article that I had written here more recently, just shortly before the pandemic, about team learning and leadership, talking about palpable outcomes, team learning and leadership and transportation. And I say, creating livable communities with integrated transportation infrastructures that preserve and, in fact, enhance our quality of place is a collective, collaborative process, and it will take all of us to realize its far-reaching benefits. And we only need to be leaders and step forward, set high standards, and then exceed them. That's awesome. Yeah, it really is. 
Love it. Always love your words of wisdom. And we're big fans of Emily too. She's been yeah. on the show and she's great. Oh, the um, episode. That was one of my favorite episodes too. I <laughs> love that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to encourage our listeners to go ahead and head over to NAP.org and check out the leadership blog, because there are some really great words of wisdom there from Ron and others who've contributed before I jump off into a new topic, which is music. Nick and I love music and we know you're a music and art person. So we always enjoy talking to you about that stuff. So I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about how music has played a role in your life. And cause I know you've had some real cool experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. It, it goes way back to my college days. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was pretty cool. I think, you know, I just, just love music. I said, well, you know, when I first became a teenager and then when I got to U of I Urbana and was studying for my uh, civil and environmental engineering degree, I actually took a part-time job at a clothing store called In Stitches. And <laughs> In Stitches was this very, very hip clothing store. They imported most of their clothing from London. So it had all the latest styles, you know, velvet clothes, tops, uh, <laughs> crushed velvet jackets. I even wow. bought a crushed velvet jacket <laughs> myself. Amazing. I and uh, they yeah, even sold uh, they sold high-heeled shoes for both women and men. And if you remember the traffic song, The Low Sparks of High-Heeled Boys, <laughs> I don't know if you remember <laughs> that. But Not that's where that specifically that whole, no. <laughs> this was in the this was in to put to frame it. This was in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So this is kind of what was going on at the time. And what was really cool is the owners of the store in Stitches. Gary Ostike was actually the lead guitarist for a group called the Finchley Boys, and the Finchley Boys actually got their name from a a gang, a youth gang in London. That's where they picked up the name. <laughs> and then uh, his partner was uh, Mary. But because they were they were playing actually not only just in Illinois and around Champaign, but in the Midwest, other groups, other musicians would actually come to the store. And right next to the In Stitches was the Leather Shop, another really cool store. And so people would just come and hang out. And so that's where I met actually uh, Gary Richrath, which was the lead guitarist for REO Speedwagon. He would, he literally would show up every week and he'd sit on the bench outside or he'd be talking to Gary, the owner and interfacing. And then uh, at the time, their uh, REO Speedwagon's drummer, uh, Alan Cranster, and their lead vocalist was uh, Terry Luttrell at the time. And then uh, ultimately, in fact, they were actually formed in 1969 and then started becoming really, really famous in the 19. 70s and their their most significant album was came out in 1980 that was called high infidelity what a name for an album high infidelity <laughs> and that also features not only that very distinctive lead guitar by uh, gary richrath but also their current singer uh, kevin gronin he has a very distinctive voice and they really so it's really cool to hang out with them and the lead singer of a band called Head East it would come around. Also, uh, the lead singer of One Eye Jack. So there were that was a big sort of music revolution at the time, and so it was so fun to be be a part of that, and so different than my engineering classes <laughs> that I was taking. <laughs> and then uh, just one one other story is I think it was yeah the summer of '69. I had just started to work at the store, both uh, Gary and, and Mary actually invited me and they say, hey, you know, there's going to be a, this incredible Woodstock Music Festival. It's going to happen in late summer of, of this year out in New York. You want to come with us? And, you know, I was tempted, but I also knew, I said, you know, I really have to go back to the farm and I've got to work very hard because I got to earn money because I'm paying my way, you know, through college. And this is how I'm doing it by working on the farm. 
And so I, I didn't uh, go with them. But, you know, the rest is history, of course. And <laughs> if you've seen the, the Woodstock movie itself, right towards the end, there's a big thunderstorm that comes through towards the end of, uh, I think it was on day three. And then after the rain, they're filming before the the fans are coming back into the seats right close to the stage. They film this young woman with long dark hair and she's got a towel and she's wiping off the rain of the seats you know to dry them so people wouldn't get wet and so they interview her a little bit well that was my friend that's my friend mary and Mm. so she's in the actual woodstock film towards the end of the movie that's really cool yeah Mm. oh i also i also met peter frampton when he was uh humble pie and they were just starting to make their uh, name known with their first hit and because the Finchley boys actually opened for them and the concert believe it or not was at U of I student union auditorium so it's a very intimate auditorium venue and so I got to meet Peter Frampton very very early in his career before he became famous (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's awesome. Cool. I haven't even heard the name Humble Pie since I live with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a different there, I a picture a parallel universe out there where Ron went to Woodstock and his <laughs> life turned out different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it would have. Uh, yeah. I think I probably would have plummeted. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, I also get a very footloosey vibe. So I picture uh, Ron, the farm boy, out there rocking and rolling. Um, <laughs> yeah. How is the farm? You still the farm's still in the family, right? Oh yes, yeah. The farm, uh, as we turn to the new year in January, will be 145 years old. Wow! Oh. And I've been since my father passed in February of 2020. We actually, two weeks before he passed, we celebrated his 95th birthday. So a very long life. One of our great World War II veterans in the U.S. Navy and actually was in the submarine Blackfish. You can imagine being in a World War submarine. Uh, But he uh, farmed until age 75. And then my cousins farmed the ground. And now my cousin's nephew is actually farming the ground for us. But I was the executor of the state because when I was getting my master's at U of I Springfield campus, I was commuting back and forth from the farm in central Illinois to Springfield where that campus is. Dad named me the executor of the state. We wrapped all of that up earlier this year. And then I created now a farm LLC for myself and my older brother, younger sister. So I'm the business manager of that. So it's going terrific. It just couldn't be any better. Very cool. Great. Yeah. What's on the farm, Ron? You got cows or you have well yeah now now we have of course corn and soybeans uh, that we're we're harvesting but when i was uh, growing up yes we had uh, cattle and we had a few uh, hogs but mostly cattle we had two different pastures so we had i think we had about 30 uh, head of cattle and one of the pastures it was bigger and then about 20, close to 20 in the other one and yeah, I can, you know, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell a couple cow stories. If, uh, yeah, heck yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, this first one, well, one of the things with taking care of animals, you have to be with them every day. You have to make sure you're out, they have plenty of water and, you know, food and feed them bales of hay and stuff like that for the whole whole herd. And so... That was part of every day's ritual to go out and uh, see how they're doing. And so one one day, and this was actually, I think, late February, so it's winter time, I was checking on the cattle herd. And, and believe it or not, certainly during the winter, I count them all to make sure they're all there. And this particular day, one of the cows was missing. And so sometimes they go off by themselves if they're normally they would have their calves in the springtime and, you know, like April, May, maybe late March, but April, May and that that sort of thing. 
And they usually go in the pasture all by themselves, and then they come back to the barn. But this time, I didn't see any cows in the pasture, but we had opened up a gate to a corn stalk field. We had harvested the corn and we let them go out there and we fenced them in and, uh, but they can graze out there to pick up the corn that, you know, maybe was missed by the combine. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so I started walking out there and then in the distance, I saw this one cow laying down. And so I walked over there and sure enough, she had unfortunately given birth to a stillborn calf. Oh. Yeah. So the weather was, you know, kind of cold and that sort of thing. But to, to make a long story short, I picked the calf up in my arms, okay, and then started walking. And then I turned around and showed the calf to the mother cow. And then she started coming and following me because she knew I had her calf. And believe it or not, we uh, walked a mile and a half together back to the uh -huh. to the barn and then i put the mother cow and the stillborn calf in a, a nice straw bedded stall in the barn and then when i laid the calf down the mother actually sort of sniffed it and then realized that it was not alive and she looked up at me and literally had tears streaming down her face uh -huh. And I have never, ever seen a cow cry since then. That's mm. the only time in my entire life I've seen that. So it's amazing. So a very intimate story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll end with a happy cow story. <laughs> um, and this one is actually, this occurred when I was farming in partnership with my dad and, and attending classes at U of I Springfield. But I was living in the, the North farmhouse by myself at the time, and I had just finished the corn and soybean harvest. And if you know anything about a farmer's life, it's a 24-7 job. Yeah. And you're usually got the combine out, fueling it up at 5 a.m., especially when you're uh, harvesting corn. And then you're harvesting until 10 p.m. And then the next day, you repeat the process. So it's just quite exhausting. But I had, on this particular weekend, it was actually Sunday morning, and I had just finished the, the soybean and the corn harvesting for the season just the, the day before. And so I thought, oh, now I can, you know, I'll just sleep in, you know, I'll just, I, I don't have to get up until like 10 or, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But interestingly, in my bedroom, it faces east. And when the sun was starting to rise, I think maybe it was around eight, eight o'clock or a little before I look out the window. And so I see this cow looking into my bedroom window. <laughs> you know, this big, broad face and nose and this huge, you know, the huge buggy eyes they have and the large forehead and the ears, you know, just looking at me. And she's like giving me this look uh, as if she wants to say, dude, you know, what what do you what do you think <laughs> you're doing? doing? I mean, <laughs> why why aren't you checking on us? You know, looking after us, you're, you're supposed to do that. And and you come around early every day and. So here she is. Well, first of all, the cow is supposed to be in the pasture and not at my bedroom window <laughs> in the front yard. And so I, I I get dressed real quickly and I go outside and the entire 30 head of cattle are in the rural road in front of my farmhouse. <laughs> and uh, somehow this cow that was looking in the window had pushed the gate open and then they all came out <laughs> and it was just uh, mayhem for a while. But fortunately, my cousin Larry uh, lives in the farmhouse just a half a mile away. And I called him and he helped me uh, rein him back into the pasture. So, <laughs> oh, man, I love the idea. The cows are like, where, where the heck is this guy? Let's go check on him. Hang on. Let's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll just push this fence up. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. We'll just go see what he's doing. <laughs> can't, get, can't even get a moment's break. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. All right, Laura, how are we doing? Fine. <laughs> Your story this got her. Your story got this her. This is why I'm vegetarian, by the way. 
So you've also, you mentioned to us before that you have sown wheat by hand. I am not a farmer, so I don't know what that means. How does that compare with like how wheat is actually normally sown commercially? Yeah, uh, normally it's uh, certainly now it's done. There's a, an implement called a drill where the seed is uh, drilled into the soil. It's pulled by a tractor and that sort of thing. And that and that process continues. We did do that when I was still a very young man. I might might even have been still in high school or just in early college or whatever. But sometimes uh, spring rains would come, you know, and we'd sow the wheat and it would drown out a section, you know, a little area of the wheat. And so my dad and I would actually literally take a grain sack and fill it full of wheat and then throw it out and replant it by hand. And I just actually very recently, within the last year, I came upon one of Van Gogh's paintings called The Sower. And it's just an incredible, incredible painting of this young man in denim clothes with a hat on. And he's out in this bare field, you know, just planting by hand this new wheat field. And it's just beautiful. The horizon is golden with the sun. And it was just amazing. And I identified with it immediately because I have actually done that, you know. And so I, well, I got to write a poem, you know, on, <laughs> on this painting. And I'd like to share it with you now. Yeah, yeah please, please do. Okay. All right. The Sower, from a painting by Van Gogh. Blackbirds soar as you walk the open field, feet tramping the blue, loamy soil, right hand releasing, bright seeds waking. It is enough to be alive on this clear morning, the sun a radiant flower unfolding, goldenrod flooding the horizon, no moon, silver moon silence. This field is your garden. You could be anyone, hold any job under the provincial sun, but rebirth begins here. First the green shoots, then stems and pulpy centers, then grain forming full in the shaft. Patience. There is time to know everything we've learned, to believe that a seed grows into something larger, a life greater than the one, to believe in love and immerse ourselves in the blue flames of its promise, to feel as close to heaven as we are to this earth. Shall we touch each other as deeply? It is enough to find your footsteps in the blue earth, connecting your work to this deep, fertile land, spreading its spirit through us, deepening our roots, our bodies feeling lighter and more at peace with the day's end. The grain sack empty, the mind and heart full. Wow. Yeah, that's great. So great. Your poems are so vivid. Yes. That's what I enjoy about them. I can feel it. You know what I mean? Not just, yeah. not just imagine, but feel it. Thank there's, you. A, there's a lot of inspiration just from looking at that painting. And I've done a lot of other poems based on paintings or work of art, or sculpture or photographs and that sort of thing. Uh, it does really inspire me. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, That's yeah. It. I love that you, you take it from, you know, Two different experiences and your experience with art and your experience with work and, and bring yeah. those together into new art. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Did and I have... think, I think it also helps me, you know, on this journey of self actualization. And it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier, just in reaching a deeper understanding of who you are as a person and then just working with that and going on that journey your entire life. So, yeah, that's awesome perspective. And did you have one more you wanted to leave us with before we left? Yeah, so I'd love to share uh, my absolute favorite poem by Mary Oliver. She's one of probably the the favorite poet of mine. Uh, she did pass in January of 2019, uh, but I, literally every week I uh, get out one of her books and read a few of her her poems. And this is my favorite. It's called "The Place I Want to Get Back to." And it talks about her encounter in the pine woods 
encountering some deer and she wrote a trilogy of poems and this is the third one of the trilogy where the deer and uh, there's this intimate contact with the deer the place i want to get back to is where in the pine woods in the moments between the darkness and first light two deer came walking down the hill and when they saw me they said to each other okay this one is okay. Let's see who she is and why she is sitting on the ground like that. So quiet, as if asleep or in a dream, but anyway, harmless. And so they came on their slender legs and gazed upon me, not unlike the way I go out to the dunes and look and look and look into the faces of the flowers. And then one of them leaned forward and nuzzled my hand. And what can my life bring me, bring to me, that could exceed that brief moment? For 20 years, I have gone every day to the same woods, not waiting exactly, just lingering. Such gifts bestowed can't be repeated. If you want to talk about this, come to visit. I live in the house near the corner, which I have named gratitude. Oh, that's nice. Isn't that powerful? Oh, yeah. And that that intimate moment of the deer nuzzling her hand uh, just sends chills, uh, chills up yes. my spine <laughs> every time I read it. Yeah, absolutely. And you have the, the perfect voice to read too. And yeah, it's it all comes together. Thank you very much for sharing. You're welcome. Yes. Really you enjoyed our time together. Yeah, we yeah, did too, for sure. So as always, before we let you go, where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, actually, um, most people know my email is very simple. It's ron.deverman at stvinc.com. It's a good way to get in, get in touch with me. So reach out. I might, I might even send you a poem or two. <laughs> that I've read. Enjoy getting them. <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Nick. Great talking with you today. That's our show. Thank you, Ron, for joining us today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody. Bye.